Prepare to embark on a journey into the unknown, where the line between reality and the supernatural blurs. Welcome to A Stranger 13 True Scary Stories, where each tale will send shivers down your spine and leave you questioning the world around you. I'm a stranger, your guide into the realm of true terror. Join me as we explore 13 chilling stories that defy explanation. From haunted houses to unexplained phenomena, these are not your ordinary horror stories. These are real-life accounts that will keep you awake at night. But beware, dear viewer, for in the world of A Stranger 13 True Scary Stories, the darkness holds secrets beyond imagination. Hit that subscribe button, turn off the lights, and get ready to be terrified, because once you enter A Stranger 13 True Scary Stories, there's no turning back. Are you brave enough to face the unknown? Click that play button and let the fear begin. Welcome to the world of A Stranger 13 True Scary Stories. Brace yourself. The quaint little town I called home was a place where trust thrived like ivy on old stone walls. A place where the notion of a stranger danger talk felt as foreign as tales of mythical creatures. In this idyllic setting, the specter of malevolence was kept at bay and the bonds of community ran deep. My parents, loving and protective, had never felt the need to have the dreaded conversation about strangers. Perhaps it was because they, too, believed in the inherent goodness of people. Or perhaps it was the safe haven we inhabited, a town where neighbors were friends and friends were family. Life took a turn toward independence when I turned six. It was then that my parents, those pillars of trust and love, decided it was time for my brother and me to learn the art of public transportation. The world expanded before our young eyes, and the sense of adventure blossomed within us. Together, my brother and I embarked on bus rides, navigating the town's routes with the exuberance only children possess. Each journey was a small victory, a step closer to adulthood, and we cherished every moment of it. It was during these uneventful rides that I cultivated the notion that adults could be trusted implicitly. In our serene haven, where the murmur of gossip was more common than whispers of caution, I never thought twice about the intentions of the grown-ups around me. My trust, it seemed, was boundless. Well, almost boundless. There was one exception to my unwavering trust, the one adult who seemed to harbor an inexplicable desire to torment me was my grandma. Her pinches and relentless teasing always elicited a measure of discomfort, even though they were more irksome than genuinely harmful. It was a family joke, and she reveled in our exaggerated protests. But the world outside my family, my small town, was an entirely different realm, and within its confines, I remained blissfully naive. It was a time when innocence cocooned me, shielding me from the harsh realities lurking in the periphery. This unmarred innocence endured until the summer of my 11th year, an age where the chrysalis of childhood had not yet fully given way to the wings of adolescence. It was during this blissful yet fragile stage that an encounter transpired, one that would forever shatter the cocoon and release the somber truth within. I was alone on a pristine beach, the golden sands stretching endlessly before me and the cerulean sea whispered secrets only I could hear. The sun painted the sky in warm hues, casting long shadows across the sands, a picture of serenity. As I wandered along the shoreline, a middle-aged man appeared like a shadow on the canvas of my solitude. His smile seemed friendly enough, and the small digital camera he held in his hand hinted at nothing more than an innocent request. Could I take a photo with you? He asked, his voice bearing a veneer of congeniality. Without a trace of apprehension, I welcomed the idea. After all, in the cocoon of my innocence, adults meant no harm. A snapshot with a stranger was just an opportunity to make a new friend. He captured the moment, his camera freezing our smiles in time. It was the next request that would unravel the tapestry of my trust. Could you take off your shirt? He asked his tone insidiously calm. We're at the beach and you'll look better without it. In my childlike innocence, I saw nothing awry in this request. It seemed reasonable, even appropriate, given the setting. So, I obliged, my trust in this stranger unwavering. With my shirt removed, I posed again, a complacent smile gracing my face. There was no discomfort, no fear, just a naive acceptance of what I believed to be an innocent request. 
He probed, engaging in casual conversation, asking about my interests. I spoke candidly of my love for video games, a passion that defined much of my young life. In response, he offered an invitation that seemed as innocuous as the setting sun casting long shadows on the sand. He told me he had a PlayStation in his room and suggested I join him for a game or two. In the innocence of youth, it was an enticing proposition, a chance to bond over shared interests. Had the sun not been making its descent toward the horizon, I might have agreed, my innocence paving the path toward a potentially dangerous encounter. But perhaps guided by some inner instinct, I offered a different response. I have to go back to my family's room. It's getting late, I told him, my voice tinged with regret. He didn't relent, his hand resting firmly on my shoulder as he urged me to reconsider. Once more, I declined, voicing my inability to accompany him. In parting, he embraced me, an act that struck me as odd, unsettling even, for I had never been one for physical contact. I cherished my personal space, and this stranger's hug felt like an unwelcome intrusion. Yet, in the moment, I brushed it off, categorizing the encounter as merely peculiar. I never spoke of it, never shared the unsettling details with anyone. Years drifted by, a ceaseless tide carrying me further from that day on the beach. It was during one of my deepest shower thoughts, a moment of quiet introspection that the full weight of that encounter came crashing down upon me. The veil of innocence had been lifted, and in its place, I saw the encounter for what it truly was, an unsettling brush with danger. The innocence I had once clung to had been shattered, and in its place stood the stark realization that not all smiles concealed goodwill. As the water cascaded over me, I understood that my world had changed irreversibly. The stranger danger talk, so foreign to my upbringing, had come too late. But it had come nonetheless, arriving when I was ready to embrace it, armed with the wisdom of experience and the sobering knowledge that the world, once seen through the eyes of a child, could be a far darker place than I had ever imagined. The oppressive neon lights of the fast food chain flickered, casting a sickly glow on the grease-stained tiles. At the tender age of 17, I had endured nearly 10 grueling months of employment at this establishment, and the story I'm about to recount played a significant role in my decision to leave. My shifts often found me stationed at the drive through window from the late afternoon until the late evening almost every weekend. It had become routine to greet familiar faces, their orders etched in my memory like well-worn paths in a forest. Politeness was the norm, with the occasional gratuity brightening our tiring shifts. However, one ominous day marked an unsettling deviation from the norm. As the sun dipped below the horizon, casting long shadows over the restaurant, I began my shift. The kitchen buzzed with frenetic energy as I shuttled trays of food to the drive through window. My interactions were typically fleeting, the hurried exchange of sustenance for currency. Yet, on this particular evening, an unfamiliar presence loomed, casting a shadow over my routine. My shift had just commenced, and I was engrossed in my duties when our gazes locked, a man in his car at the drive through window, his eyes locked onto mine. A shiver coursed down my spine, a sensation difficult to ignore. Busy as we were, I chose to dismiss my unease, attributing it to the demands of the rush hour and the fatigue that was slowly settling in. As my manager prepared my cash drawer, I assumed my position at the drive through window ready to process orders and payments. The evening rush was in full swing, a cacophony of voices and clinking coins. Amidst the flurry, one voice stood out, an unfamiliar, hesitant murmur, like a gentle breeze amidst a storm. Could I have a sandwich? The voice quivered, a request spoken with trepidation. I quickly calculated the total and relayed it to the customer. When he arrived at the window, it was the same man from earlier. I reasoned that he had merely forgotten to place his order a minor oversight. His car sat low to the ground, forcing him to stretch his arm outward to hand me his debit card. As he did so, he muttered something under his breath, a cryptic utterance that barely reached my ears. I'm sorry, what was that? I queried, sensing an undercurrent of discomfort. His response left me profoundly unsettled. I said you're looking beautiful today. 
My heart raced, a cascade of emotions surging within me. Not only did I have a boyfriend, but I was also underage, an unwelcome advance that crossed boundaries. Oh, thank you, I stammered nervously, my voice quivering. I handed him his bag of food and swiftly closed the window, my gaze avoiding his as he drove away. Once the momentary encounter had passed, I found solace in commiserating with some of my male co-workers as we often did with strange customers. Yet a lingering unease gnawed at me. The evening wore on and despite the commotion of orders and the bustling kitchen, my mind circled back to that unsettling encounter. As twilight faded into night, our drive through line continued to swell with an average wait time of around 10 minutes. Then a voice over the intercom caught my attention, an all too familiar voice, low and filled with agitation, demanding a cup of water. I glanced at the man's face through his car's windshield, my instincts screaming for caution. I stepped away from the window, hoping my manager would handle him. The pattern persisted throughout the day with requests for straws and various other complimentary items. With each encounter, my conviction grew stronger. This man's motives extended beyond mere thirst. My frustration peaked, saturating my workday with discomfort. Unable to endure the torment any longer, I retreated to the bathroom and allowed myself a moment of vulnerability. Tears flowed freely, my resolve shaken by the unwelcome attention. I had always prided myself on having thick skin, but this relentless pursuit had eroded my resilience. The night crawled on, my apprehension unabated. However, the man's unwelcome presence did not manifest again. I believed, perhaps naively, that our paths would never cross once more. Little did I know that our encounter would be far from over, that it would haunt my final shift at the restaurant several months later. In 2015, I found myself stationed at Fort Hood, Texas, a place etched in the annals of military history. It was a time of formation, discipline, and the unrelenting Texas sun. But what transpired during my service there, I could never have predicted. Our command sergeant major, a formidable figure known for his stern demeanor, became enraged one fateful day. The cause of his ire was soldiers failing to show up on time for formation. He pointed his finger squarely at the non-commissioned officers, NCOs, blaming them for not picking up soldiers and ensuring their punctual arrival. It struck me as odd, as just recently an NCO and company executive officer, CEO, had faced consequences for having soldiers in their vehicle en route to a formation when they were involved in a car wreck. Yet, we carried on as good soldiers do, despite the perplexing circumstances. I was relatively new to this unit, and I went above and beyond, driving out of my way to pick up soldiers and ensure they reached formation promptly. However, there was one particular soldier who seemed immune to the concept of punctuality. Each morning, as I waited for him to join the ranks, I could hear him shuffling on the other side of his door. My patience wore thin, and all I could think was, just open the door, man, so we can go. I cared little about the state of his room or whether he had a partner inside. He was holding us all back and I made that clear to him. But my candidness triggered an unexpected turn of events. Instead of understanding my frustration, he did a 180 and reported me to the Equal Opportunity Leader, EOL. The EOL's responsibility was to address cases of hate crimes and discriminatory actions. In a shocking twist, he accused me of being prejudiced against him because he was Asian. I was livid and my response was swift, I'm Asian too. Why should that matter? I emphasized that his counseling statement should reflect the truth. It was at this point that the command sergeant major became directly involved in the situation. However, his intervention took an unexpected and sinister turn. Within a mere day or two, all NCOs, including myself, were relocated to a condemned barracks. The conditions were deplorable with black mold festering up and down the walls and ceilings that had collapsed in the hallways. The building was a decrepit and hazardous place. In one hallway, a vending machine stood with shattered glass and rats scurried about. Some rooms had broken windows and one bore the unspeakable marks of feces smeared on the walls. We were bewildered, wondering why our senior leadership had subjected us to this appalling environment. 
In search of answers, we organized a meeting with the sergeant major to understand why he had placed us in such squalor. His response was baffling and unsettling. He simply stated, because you all deserve it. It was a response that left us questioning the motives behind this punishment. Determined to uncover the truth, I decided to contact the Directorate of Public Works, DPW, to inquire about the status of the barracks. What I discovered was astonishing. The building had been condemned due to the rampant black mold infestation. Chaos reigned as soldiers began to react to the disarray. Doors were broken inward in the office area on the main floor, and some individuals took advantage of the situation, taking whatever they pleased, while others resorted to selling items. But the situation was destined to take a darker turn. None of us had been aware of the existence of a basement until curiosity drove us to explore further. As we descended into the depths of the barracks, we were met with an eerie silence that seemed to permeate the air. The basement was flooded, and in a drunken stupor that only 22-year-olds could muster, we ventured deeper. Amidst the water-warped furniture and the echoes of our footsteps, we stumbled upon something utterly unexpected, a homeless camp. The discovery sent shockwaves through our ranks, and we promptly reported it to our leadership. However, our concerns were met with indifference as no action was taken to address the situation. A few weeks later, the term IPCS entered our vocabulary. It stood for in-place consecutive service, indicating a permanent change of station. The events that transpired in the condemned barracks seemed to fade into the background as we prepared for new orders and new beginnings. A little did we know that the true extent of the darkness lurking within those walls was yet to be revealed. One night, as the Texas winds howled outside, I found myself in the company of my buddy D. Sean. We were engrossed in video games, a welcome distraction from the bizarre events of recent days. Hours passed, and D. Sean eventually left, heading to his room for some rest. I continued playing, oblivious to the eerie atmosphere that had settled in the barracks. Hours stretched into the night when, suddenly, my attention was drawn to something chilling. An eyeball, stark white against the darkness, peered through my window. In my slightly inebriated state, I leaned forward and made eye contact with the intruder, believing it to be D.E. Sean playing a prank. But as our gazes locked, it became evident that this was not my friend. The eyes that met mine were larger and wider, sending a shiver down my spine. Panic set in as I leaned even closer, my hand instinctively reaching for a knife in a drawer. My thoughts raced, and I prepared myself for a possible confrontation, albeit in a drunken haze. It seemed I was on the brink of an impromptu knife fight within the barracks. Just as I braced for what might come next, the doorknob began to jiggle. My heart pounded, and my brow broke into a cold sweat. The intruder continued to peer into the room, his eyes locked with mine. Then, with an air of eerie calm, he finally spoke, Is Jack here? My immediate instinct was to fight, but all that emerged from my mouth was a trembling, No, sir. The intruder withdrew abruptly, slamming the door closed behind him. In a state of shock and disbelief, I wasted no time. I immediately dialed D. Sean's number, asking if he had been messing with me. He rushed over, and together we attempted to make sense of the surreal encounter. In an inexplicable act of foolishness, we decided to venture back into the basement, this time sober and alert. As we descended the stairs, our flashlights pierced the darkness, illuminating a new, previously unexplored door. With hesitation, we opened it. What lay beyond was beyond comprehension. Inside, the room was filled with support beams and, more shockingly, the remnants of a homeless encampment. We reported the discovery to our leadership, expecting immediate action. However, our concerns were once again met with indifference and the sinister secrets of the condemned barracks remained shrouded in mystery. As the days passed, the barracks continued to be a place of dark intrigue, with whispers and rumors circulating among the soldiers. We had no choice but to prepare for our impending PCS orders, hoping that our new destination would bring answers and leave the haunting memories of Fort Hood far behind. When I was younger, around the ripe age of 13, I used to babysit for my neighbor, whom I had a close connection with. We'll call her C, and her son, who was on the spectrum, J. 
Our bond ran deep, forged through years of friendship with her kids before they moved away to live with their dad, a tower drive from our neighborhood. One Friday night, with nothing on my agenda, C asked if I could watch over Jay while she went out to meet a guy she had known for a couple of years. C was a woman with a complex life. She had a wide network of friends, some of whom were not the most reputable. The kids in our neighborhood, including me, had grown up in her life, taking care of her children and babysitting whenever she needed us. She had connections and a significant social status in our community. People who loved and cared for her lived within a two-minute radius while others were scattered across the country. So when she asked me to babysit for her on that random Friday night and mentioned the guy's name, a name I had never heard before, it didn't strike me as unusual. C's house, car, and clothes weren't the fanciest, but I didn't hold that against her. She was a single mom, working three jobs to support her two kids and a toddler. At around 10 p.m. after spending a relatively easy four hours with Jay, I changed him into his pajamas and tucked him into bed. I put on the movie cars for him since he was obsessed with it at the time and he fell asleep quickly. This left me alone in the living room, waiting for C's return. I decided to call her to check if she was on her way home. She mentioned that she was leaving the bar just as I called, her voice slurring with intoxication. I hoped the guy she was with would drive her the short three-minute distance to her house. About seven minutes later, I noticed a sleek 2017 BMW 3 Series pull into the driveway. It was an unexpected sight and suspicion crept in. I peered out the window to see if I could spot C in the passenger seat. As mentioned earlier, C didn't have the nicest belongings, so this car seemed out of place. I watched as she stumbled out of the car, and the man who had driven her helped her into the house. I greeted him, but he didn't provide his name. He smiled and thanked me for watching Jay so he could spend time with C. I assured him it wasn't a problem and wished them a good time. Skipping ahead about 10 minutes, C asked me where Jay was. I informed her that it was late, so I had put him to bed, suggesting she change into comfortable clothes. Strangely, she chose to lie down in her bed fully clothed and quickly fell asleep, leaving me, a young teenager, alone with a man in his 40s who was balding. We ended up sitting on the kitchen floor, engrossed in a seemingly random deep conversation. At one point, he asked me to knock on his ribs, curiosity getting the better of me, I complied. What I heard sent shivers down my spine, a hard, metallic thump as though his ribs were made of metal. I pulled back, my eyes wide with astonishment and concern, and asked him about it. He sighed, leaned back, and lifted his shirt slightly, revealing a skin graft on his abdomen with a completely different shade of skin and stitches all around it. My gaze shifted, noticing scars on his stomach and chest, some of which resembled bullet wounds. My mind raced, unable to comprehend what I was witnessing. His voice trembled as he began to tell me his story. Two years ago, he began, I proposed to my girlfriend and she had organized a barbecue to announce it to her family. When I arrived and saw her cooking, I looked at the barbecue skeptically. She had never made one before. When I took a bite, it turned out to be really dry and I coughed discreetly. I listened intently, my heart pounding, as he continued, she asked if it was good and to avoid a fight, I reluctantly said yes. However, I couldn't stop coughing. She inquired about what was wrong with it and I confessed that it was a little dry. This triggered an argument and I decided to head to my car. The man's story became increasingly horrifying. However, he continued, she beat me to it and got into her car. As she backed up, she intentionally hit me with her car and continued to run over my ribs 13 times. I was in shock. How could someone endure such an ordeal? Why would anyone do that to another human being? My mind raced and I couldn't help but wonder, am I in danger? These were the obvious questions that flooded my thoughts when faced with such a terrifying story. Was this older guy joking or was this real? Who is this man? I gathered the courage to ask him, but who are you? What's your name? He looked at me and his eyes changed, his demeanor becoming deadly serious. Which one? He replied cryptically. Bewildered, I clarified the name you were given at birth. He chuckled briefly, but abruptly stopped. I have hundreds of names, he said, and I can't disclose a single one. 
My anxiety intensified as he continued to speak, revealing unsettling details about his life. I'm wanted in 12 countries, across many regions on the west coast, he declared, his voice filled with a haunting gravity. I felt a cold sweat forming on my forehead. I had no idea if he was being genuine or not, but then he reached into his wallet and pulled out at least 10 different IDs. It was a chilling sight that left no room for doubt. He stared into my eyes, his gaze piercing. If you or C ever need someone gone, erased from your lives just like that, he said, snapping his fingers for emphasis. Tell C to reach out and I can make it happen. With that ominous promise, he stood up, opened the door, got into his luxury car, and disappeared from my sight. The unsettling encounter had taken a sinister turn, leaving me with countless questions and an overwhelming sense of unease. The incident didn't end there. It only got worse, leaving me with a haunting uncertainty that would persist in the years to come. When I asked C the next morning about the man she had come home with, she responded with confusion, saying, What guy? I described his car, his injured ribs, and his bald head, desperately hoping for answers. But her response sent a chill down my spine. I have no idea what you're talking about, she replied. To this day, I remain in the dark about whom that mysterious man was, what his real name was, where he came from, and whether his chilling tales were truth or fiction. Only three weeks have passed, but the memory still haunts me. There's no doubt in my mind that my patient and I were nearly prey to a predator, an encounter that unfolded in the midst of my duties. I work for the state, providing support to individuals grappling with substance abuse disorders, mental health issues, and to a lesser extent, those with developmental delays. My role when dealing with those who face developmental challenges is akin to that of a lower-ranked social worker. I'm entrusted with the task of ensuring that participants can attain their personal goals for the year, akin to an individualized education program, IEP, in public schools. This tale unfolds during a routine visit to one of my patients. Her goal for the year was to walk or hike at least one mile three times a week. To assess her progress, she decided to take us both on a journey through the trails nearby. It's worth mentioning that she and I share a common age, both of us having reached the milestone of 40. As we embarked on our nature walk, the surroundings shifted from the familiar trail that meandered around a neighborhood pond bustling with people to something markedly more isolated. The path now led us into the heart of the woods, flanked by sprawling cotton fields. We walked and conversed, enjoying the natural beauty that enveloped us. However, tranquility gave way to an unsettling pause when my patient abruptly halted her steps. Her expression conveyed a deep sense of unease, and just as she was about to voice her discomfort, an overwhelming feeling washed over me, a feeling of being watched. Strangely, I didn't experience fear. Instead, I felt an inexplicable urge to protect her. Due to our shared developmental challenges, I found myself more concerned for her safety than my own. It's a difficult sensation to articulate, but it was as if an instinctive guardian within me had awakened. My senses heightened and I couldn't shake the notion that someone was lurking in the shadows, fixated on us. I knew instinctively that something was amiss. I turned my gaze to the path we had traversed, my ears catching the disconcerting sound of leaves crunching underfoot. And there, emerging from the woods, was a man in his thirties, his movements slow and surreptitious, akin to a predator stalking its prey. The isolation of the trail, coupled with the absence of any other soul in sight, amplified the sinister undertones of this encounter. It was abundantly clear that whatever his intentions, they were far from benign. In that precarious moment, my role transformed from guardian to protector. In a decisive move, I urged my patient to continue walking, giving her a head start. Why I did this, I cannot say, but it seemed like the right thing to do. I then executed a risky maneuver, a complete about-face. I halted my steps, turned, and locked eyes with the approaching stranger. Silence prevailed, no words were exchanged, but in that shared gaze, something profound transpired. It was as if a switch had been flipped within him. He froze, his predatory advance stymied by my unwavering stare. His hesitation was palpable and it was evident that he had realized we were aware of his presence. 
In that pivotal moment, my gaze served as a powerful deterrent, a guardian's unspoken warning that we were not defenseless. With my eyes trained on him, I began a backward retreat, ensuring he understood that our attention remained fixated upon his actions. Simultaneously, I glanced at my patient, and she too cast her gaze in his direction. It was a united front, an unspoken declaration that we would not be victims. In response to our unyielding vigilance, the stranger, who had appeared out of thin air, melted back into the woods with the same eerie silence that had heralded his arrival. If his intentions had been as innocent as a leisurely stroll along a nature trail, he could have continued on his way, passing us by without disruption. Yet, his abrupt halt and the manner in which he vanished into the underbrush left no room for doubt. In my heart, I hold an unshakable conviction that it was the collective sense of foreboding, my patience, intuition, and my unwavering watchfulness that averted a sinister fate. We may never know the extent of the danger that lurked in the shadows that day, but our instincts and unspoken unity acted as an impenetrable shield. In those woods, we were not helpless prey. We became guardians of our own fate, determined to defy whatever malevolent designs that man may have harbored. About eight years ago, my girlfriends and I, in our youthful naivety, embarked on adventures that, in hindsight, were perilously foolhardy. Armed with the audacity of youth and the reckless abandon of curiosity, we downloaded Plenty of Fish, a platform that connected us with strangers unaware of the risks that loomed in the secluded corners of Pennsylvania. On one ominous night, our curiosity led us to a peculiar individual we shall call Todd. Todd was an enigma, an embodiment of social distance that set off alarm bells in the depths of my intuition. As he slid into the back of my SUV, a palpable wave of regret washed over me, a premonition of the unsettling events that would unfold. Our destination was Ronnie's Point, an eerie locale nestled in the heart of West Virginia, a haven for enthusiasts of ghosts and haunted histories. Todd, however, had no intention of joining our escapades immediately. He opted to remain in the car, an act that sent shivers down my spine. Red flags waved ominously in the recesses of my mind, but curiosity tethered us to our path, blinding us to the danger that lurked in the shadows. The night cloaked Ronnie's point in a sinister ambience as we ventured into the abandoned hospital, our senses heightened by the eerie silence that surrounded us. Out of the darkness, Todd emerged suddenly, his presence a jarring intrusion that elicited a collective gasp from us. His unsettling comments cast a chilling pall over the night, revealing a disturbing connection to the asylum adjacent to the hospital. He callously recounted tales of sick individuals being shot for amusement, his laughter punctuating the macabre narrative. As we delved deeper into our exploration, Todd lingered ominously in the background, his silence amplifying the unease that settled upon us. The night wore on, and as we decided to leave, Todd insisted on sitting directly behind me in the car. Oblivious to the mounting discomfort in the vehicle, I began driving towards the nearest gas station a mere few minutes away. It was during this seemingly routine drive that the atmosphere soured. Todd's hands, slimy with an unsettling intent, slithered up my shoulders, attempting a gesture that filled me with repulsion. Desperate to communicate my lack of interest, I leaned forward, hoping he would understand. His grip tightened, his voice dripping with disdain as he chastised us for inviting strangers into our car, painting vivid images of potential harm. In a chilling moment, he whispered a sinister suggestion, his tone dripping with malice. Maybe the person's in the car with you right now, he sneered, his words etching fear into our souls. Fueled by terror and outrage, I pulled into the gas station and demanded Todd's departure. To my surprise, he complied, exiting the vehicle and leaving behind a cloud of malevolence. Back home, my friend attempted to sever ties with Todd, but he had vanished from the digital realm, leaving us with lingering dread and unanswered questions. The incident served as a harrowing wake-up call, a stark reminder of the perilous reality that lurked behind the screen. We vowed never again to invite strangers into our intimate adventures, realizing the grave folly of our youthful indiscretions. 
The shadows of regret cast by that night would haunt our memories, a cautionary tale etched in the annals of our shared experiences, forever reminding us of the dangers that dwell in the darkness of the unknown. In the quaint embrace of a small college town in Pennsylvania, where the echoes of youthful dreams danced in the air, my family resided in a modest one-story house. It stood sentinel at the corner beside IUP, a silent witness to the stories of its inhabitants. These were the vibrant yet precarious 90s, a time when innocence often masked the shadows that lurked just beyond the edges of our perception. My mother, burdened by her own demons, was not the nurturing figure a child yearns for. Her neglectful habits left my little brother and me home alone from a tender age, our days often woven with threads of uncertainty. On one fateful day, a day etched into my memory like a scar, my world brushed against the edge of something far darker than the usual childhood fears. It was a seemingly ordinary day, the kind where the world spun lazily, unaware of the storm brewing on the horizon. My mother, her footsteps tentative yet purposeful, announced her intention to walk to the nearby grocery store. A mere 10 to 15 minutes separated us from the store, but in those minutes, the fabric of my reality would be forever altered. In a moment of caprice, I chose to stay behind, my decision shrouded in the ephemeral whims of a child's mind. Regret, a bitter aftertaste, followed swiftly in the wake of her departure. The sight of her standing at the intersection, my little brother by her side, ignited a sudden longing to join them. I want to go. I cried out, my voice piercing the stillness of the day. She acquiesced but not without condition, I needed to fetch a jacket. I hurried home, the weight of my decision heavy on my shoulders. Yet, in those moments, fate conspired against me. When I returned to the intersection, the world had shifted. My mother was gone, leaving behind a void filled only by the distant silhouette of a man. He emerged like a specter from my peripheral vision, a figure in his early twenties, adorned in a black trench coat that billowed ominously with his movements. Spiked hair adorned his head, and beneath him, the sinister hum of rollerblades resonated against the pavement. Paranoia gripped me, a primal instinct that sent my legs into a frantic sprint. The sound of his approaching rollerblades, a menacing staccato, underscored my fear. The distance between us shrank with every heartbeat, his presence a haunting shadow on my heels. I reached my home, my sanctuary, and slammed the door shut, the echo reverberating through the empty house. In my trembling hands, I clutched a metal pipe, a desperate attempt at courage in the face of imminent danger. The world outside fell silent, a deafening stillness that contrasted sharply with the pounding of my heart. The tranquility shattered like glass as knocks rained upon my front door, each strike resonating with the threat of the unknown. Terror gripped me, the certainty of impending doom twisting my insides. In that moment, I made a choice, a choice to fight, to resist the encroaching darkness with every ounce of strength within me. Under my bed, in the narrow space between reality and imagination, I hid, my fingers clenched around the cold metal of the pipe. Tom stretched a taut thread ready to snap as I waited. The knock ceased, but my heart refused respite, its frantic rhythm mirroring my own desperate plea for safety. The silence shattered once more, my eyes widening in horror as I turned my head. There he was, the man on rollerblades, his face contorted into a sinister grin, his eyes locking onto mine through the window. I screamed a primal sound that echoed my terror and retreated back into the sanctuary of darkness beneath my bed. Finally, salvation arrived in the form of my mother. I spilled the tale of my encounter, my words laden with fear and disbelief. Yet, to my dismay, she didn't believe me. Her skepticism hung heavy in the air, a suffocating blanket that smothered the truth I held within me. The knowledge that she dismissed my ordeal haunted me, leaving behind a bitter seed of doubt. In the years that followed, I couldn't shake the questions that gnawed at my mind. What did he want? Why did he pursue me with such malevolence? The answers remained elusive, lost in the labyrinth of the unknown. That encounter, a fleeting yet profound moment in my life, left behind scars that transcended the physical, etching a tale of vulnerability and survival into the very fabric of my being.
The human mind, a tapestry woven with threads of memory and emotion, sometimes hides fragments of the past in the crevices of consciousness. It takes a particular trigger and unexpected jolt to unravel these hidden pieces and bring them into the unforgiving light of the present. It was a seemingly inconspicuous moment, a stranger passing by my workplace, their eyes inadvertently meeting mine through a small window. Harmless, yet it unleashed a torrent of forgotten memories, memories that had been buried deep, concealed by the passage of time. The tendrils of recollection wound back to the very first house of my childhood, a place where innocence should have reigned, but where darkness lurked just beneath the surface. We moved away when I was merely six, yet the specter of that house lingered in the recesses of my mind, a shadow that whispered of things I had once resented but now understood. In that house, an unassuming abode on a quiet street, there existed a neighbor, a man whose presence sent ripples of discomfort through the neighborhood. His status as a registered offender, a fact he was compelled to disclose, should have been warning enough. Yet, the sinister nature of his actions surpassed mere labels. He moved in, and with him came a wave of odd and unsettling incidents. He sprinted across the street, leaving an indelible mark on a neighbor's garage door, a testament to his erratic behavior. Another neighbor found herself the recipient of his uninvited intrusion. Trembling, he begged to be held, an unsettling plea that ended with her summoning the authorities, his inappropriate arousal confirming the sinister undercurrent of his intentions. My revelation didn't end with my mother's confirmation. A digital trail, a chilling discovery on social media, sealed the reality of my haunting memory. His face, the same face I had once seen pressed against the glass of our living room window, was now before me on a screen. The sight of him, even though the cold barrier of a computer monitor, evoked a visceral reaction, a profound nausea that clawed at my insides. I remember that day vividly, a bright afternoon tainted by the intrusion of fear. The living room, my sanctuary, became a theater for a nightmare. As I sat, innocent and unaware, watching the flickering images on the television, a sensation crawled over my skin. The feeling of being watched, scrutinized by unseen eyes, drew my gaze to the front windows. There he was his face and hands pressed against the glass, a grotesque caricature of a smile stretched across his features. His eyes, wide and manic, locked onto mine. A chill gripped my spine as I was abruptly lifted from my seat, enfolded in protective arms, whisked away to another room. My grandmother, my savior, had sensed the danger, shielding me from the horrors that lurked just beyond our walls. As I reflect on this unearthed memory, I find myself engulfed in a complex web of emotions. Fear, gratitude, and a profound understanding intermingle, painting a portrait of the past that is both haunting and enlightening. In the innocent eyes of a child, danger had worn a familiar face, a face that had haunted my dreams and seeped into the corners of my subconscious. But beyond the fear lies a deeper truth, a truth that resonates with the resilience of the human spirit. We moved, escaping the clutches of that ominous presence, leaving behind the house of shadows. In the embrace of a new home, I found solace, a sanctuary where the specter of fear had no place. This chapter of my life, now unveiled, serves as a reminder of the fragility of innocence and the strength born from adversity. It reinforces the importance of vigilance, of listening to the whispers of intuition that often go unheard in the cacophony of daily life. Just as shadows fade in the presence of light, so too did the specter of that house retreat in the face of our departure. In revisiting this memory, I find closure, a sense of resolution that comes from understanding the past. The face that once haunted my dreams is now just a fragment of history, a chilling chapter in the book of my life. I carry the lessons of that chapter with me, a beacon of awareness that guides my steps, reminding me to cherish the safety I now possess and to never underestimate the power of a buried memory waiting to resurface and reshape the narrative of our lives. One year ago, in the digital twilight of an online connection, I encountered her. The allure of her words, the promise of shared interests, all seemed like stars aligning in a cosmic dance. We delved deep into conversations, exchanging not just messages, but pieces of our lives. 
It was as though a novel's plot was unfolding before my very eyes. Little did I know, I was stepping into the pages of a thriller, the kind that sends shivers down your spine. In the beginning, her affection was almost intoxicating. Her words, though confined to a screen, wrapped around me like a silken web. I, a gentleman by nature, was flattered by her adoration. She seemed perfect, almost too perfect. It was in her persistent pursuit, her obsession, that the first shadows of doubt began to creep into my mind. Our interactions, once filled with playful emojis and subtle nuances, transformed. Emojis vanished, replaced by stark, emotionless words. The tone shifted, the once leisurely pace replaced by instant responses. It was as though a stranger had hijacked her phone, a sinister puppeteer pulling the strings. The turning point arrived on a dimly lit Saturday evening. The rendezvous was set at a local park, a place where innocence should have prevailed. But as the sun dipped below the horizon, an eerie atmosphere settled over the scene. She arrived late, her car shrouded in darkness. As I waited, a chilling feeling seeped into my bones, a premonition of impending danger. She emerged from her car, her features obscured by the night. The smile that once charmed me seemed strained, her eyes devoid of warmth. Something was amiss, something beyond the realm of my comprehension. As I stood there, a pawn in a game I didn't understand, I realized the gravity of the situation. My instincts, sharper than ever, screamed at me to flee. Yet, curiosity rooted me in place. Seconds stretched into eternity as I stared at her, trying to decipher the enigma before me. Then, a call pierced the silence, jolting me from my stupor. Simultaneously, doors creaked open, not one, but several. The darkness within the car concealed the number of intruders, but fear, raw and primal, gripped my heart. In that moment, fight or flight took hold, a surge of adrenaline propelling me into motion. Without looking back, I ran, each step pounding in rhythm with my racing heart. The world blurred around me as I sprinted, a desperate escape from the unknown horrors that lurked behind. In the safety of distance, I blocked her number, severing the digital tie that bound us. But the scars of that night, the imprint of fear, remained etched in my memory. I pondered the motives, the sinister plot that had unfolded. Was it jealousy, revenge, or something far more sinister? The news was rife with stories of vengeful lovers turning into monsters, leaving victims in their wake. I had narrowly escaped becoming a statistic, a cautionary tale of the dangers lurking beneath seemingly innocent encounters. Looking back, I realized the importance of trusting one's instincts, of heeding the subtle warnings that life often presents. It was a chapter etched in the book of my experiences, a tale of deception and narrow escape. In the labyrinth of online connections, I had found myself entangled in a web of shadows, a place where reality blurred and danger lurked behind every screen. As I closed that chapter, I carried with me not just the memory of fear, but the wisdom of discernment. In a world where connections are forged with a click, I had learned that not everything that glitters in the digital realm is gold. Beneath the veneer of smiles and compliments, darkness could reside, waiting to engulf the unwary. And so, I emerged from that nightmarish encounter with a newfound resolve, a shield forged from experience. The online world, once a realm of endless possibilities, had revealed its underbelly. But armed with caution and the lessons of the past, I ventured forth, wiser and more vigilant. The shadows of that night served as a reminder, a chilling whisper that echoed in my thoughts, urging me to tread carefully in the intricate dance of digital connections. The fog hung low that morning, cloaking the neighborhood in an eerie silence broken only by the muffled sounds of our shoes against the pavement. My brother, sister, and I, a trio of young souls on the cusp of another ordinary day, walked towards our bus stop. The mist clung to us, lending an otherworldly quality to the surroundings. A small white sedan materialized through the fog, its headlights cutting through the gray like ghostly eyes. It pulled up beside us, matching our pace, and out of the mist emerged a woman, her long curly brown hair cascading around her face. She wore a strange smile, her eyes oddly vacant yet piercing. Hey, kids, heading to school? Her voice was too sweet, too saccharine for the early hour. We exchanged glances, confusion etched on our faces. 
With our backpacks slung over our shoulders, it was obvious where we were headed. Yes, I replied, my seven-year-old self eager for a free ride, but my sister's grip on my arm tightened painfully. No thanks, she said, her voice firm, her eyes locked with the strangers. The woman's smile wavered as if caught in a fleeting moment of uncertainty. Oh, it's fine, really. You don't have to walk. I can take you quickly. Her words used false kindness, sending a shiver down my spine. No, my sister's voice was steel, her eyes sharp with determination. The woman's car inched closer to the curb, trapping us in its malevolent aura. Fear held us in its grip. Yet in the car, the woman snarled, her smile contorting into a sinister sneer, revealing teeth that seemed too sharp, too predatory. My sister, fueled by a mixture of terror and adrenaline, hoisted me up and barked at my brother to run. She sprinted, her grip on my hand vice-like, her feet pounding the pavement. My heart raced, the world blurring around me as we fled, my sister's breathless gasps urging us forward. We were chased by the specter of a kidnapping, a nightmare made real. The car roared behind us, its engine a malevolent growl. My sister, her strength magnified by sheer willpower, pulled us onward. We stumbled, almost falling twice, the harsh impact of the concrete beneath my palms a visceral reminder of our vulnerability. But we did not stop. We couldn't afford to. Not until we reached the safety of our home. Finally, gasping for breath, we tumbled through our front door, locking it behind us. Sobbing, we clung to one another, our young minds grappling with the raw, unfiltered fear that had gripped us moments ago. When our parents returned, their arms enveloping us in a comforting embrace, we recounted the terrifying ordeal. Their faces mirrored our horror, and in that moment, the fragility of our innocence became painfully clear. We had narrowly escaped the clutches of a predator, a stranger with a smile as cold and sharp as a blade. In the following days, the incident lingered in our minds, a dark shadow tainting the innocence of our childhood. We became more vigilant, our laughter often laced with an underlying tension. The memory of that foggy morning, the stranger's smile etched into our minds, served as a stark reminder of the dangers that lurked beyond the familiar confines of our home. Yet, amidst the fear, there was gratitude. Gratitude for my sister's unwavering strength, her refusal to succumb to the stranger's sinister charm. If it hadn't been for her, I might have been snatched away, my fate forever altered. And so, the lesson was etched into our hearts, a lesson about trust and the peril that could arise from the simple act of accepting a stranger's offer. The fog of that morning had lifted, but the imprint of that chilling smile remained, a cautionary tale whispered through the ages, reminding us to be vigilant, to be wary, and above all, to trust the instincts that had saved us that day. In the eerie silence of the graveyard shift, I, a lone guardian, patrolled the recycling yard. My duty was to protect, yet I found myself more vulnerable than ever. It was my second week on the job, every hour marked by rounds across a vast expanse of metal where precious metals lay in broken fragments, awaiting transformation and resale. On this fateful night, after venturing through the grassy, bushy terrain and over the desolate train tracks, I aimed my flashlight, its 2K lumens piercing the darkness to capture the distant warehouse. The routine act, however, turned sinister as a chilling sensation crept over me. The hairs on my neck stood at attention and a shiver raced down my spine. I was not alone. A swift turn revealed a sight that would haunt my dreams. A skinny, old man, his skin etched with wrinkles, sat calmly on a metal chair. His eyes, deep and piercing, met mine. His attire was worn, dirty jean overalls barely covering his bony frame and a tattered cowboy fedora perched atop his head. Despite my imposing stature, I screamed in sheer terror, dropping my flashlight. Metal shards littered the ground and darkness swallowed everything. In those moments, the world became a symphony of clanging metal and hurried footsteps, echoing a dreadful tune of fear. The old man, his intent unknown, was merely yards away. His eyes, filled with a haunting curiosity, bore into mine. I fumbled for my flashlight, heart pounding in my chest. The clanging footsteps grew nearer, a cacophony of imminent danger. 
Just as the metal symphony reached its crescendo, the sounds veered sharply to my left, fading into the distance, leaving behind only the rustling of bushes. I recovered my flashlight, heart still racing, and shone it toward the noise. But the old man had vanished, swallowed by the night and the secrets it held. Adrenaline coursed through me, urging me to action. With trembling hands, I dialed emergency contacts, my voice shaky as I recounted the night's chilling events. By the time help arrived, the mysterious old man was nowhere to be found, leaving behind only the metal chair facing the tracks. I took a photograph not as evidence, but as a memento of a night when reality blurred into nightmare. I felt compelled to share my story to unburden the weight of fear that clung to me. Yet, within the confines of my office, I remained alone, haunted by the events of that night. As the hours of the graveyard shift stretched ahead, I found solace in the beam of my flashlight, its glow dispelling the darkness that seemed to seep into my very soul. I was a sentinel in the night, a witness to the unknown, standing guard in the face of fear. The chair, now a silent sentinel of its own, stood testament to a presence that defied explanation, a presence that had chosen to reveal itself in the dead of night, leaving me with a tale that would forever linger in the recesses of my mind. So this story took place when I was 12 years old. It's a memory that has clung to me even though it's more than half of my lifespan ago. I still get really uneasy when thinking back to it as if the events of that day were etched into my very core. I was walking home from school, a four kilometer journey along a busy road. I was alone as I often was during those walks. It was at one of the intersections that I crossed paths with a tall, dirty looking man. I'd guess his age was somewhere in his early 30s, but as a kid, I struggled to gauge the age of adults accurately. He noticed me, and that's when things took a disconcerting turn. He started following me, trying to strike up a conversation. His words were laced with an eerie friendliness. He kept telling me how beautiful everything was, including me, and that he wanted us to be friends. He delved into personal questions, asking where I lived and whether my parents would be home. Each query made me more uncomfortable, but I tried to be polite. I didn't answer any of his questions, I just quickened my pace. As we neared my block, my unease grew. He wanted to follow me home, and I certainly didn't want that. He gave off an inexplicable vibe, adults didn't usually speak to me in such a manner. The only way I could think to get rid of him was to give him my cell phone number and agree to answer when he called. In my discomfort, I gave him a fake number and fled the scene as fast as my legs would carry me. For a few months, I managed to put that unsettling encounter out of my mind, convincing myself that he was just a random weirdo. However, as you can probably guess, things didn't stay that way. Approximately four months later, I found myself walking home from school once more. On this particular day, I admit I wasn't paying much attention to my surroundings. That changed abruptly when I heard what sounded like footsteps racing up behind me. My reflexes kicked in and I turned to look around. To my horror, it was the same creepy man from before. He had slowed his pace as he reached me, but he was yelling the entire time. He had figured out that I had given him a fake number and he was furious. His anger was palpable and I was genuinely afraid that he might hurt me. I desperately tried to catch the attention of passing motorists, but it was futile. I sped walked to the closest petrol station, which fortunately wasn't too far away, with him trailing behind, still yelling. When I reached the petrol station, I immediately attracted the attention of two burly men who were standing next to their pickup truck. They must have seen the terror in my eyes and the man following me because they rushed over to ask if I was alright. I was too scared to speak, so I just shook my head frantically. I positioned myself behind them, seeking refuge in their presence. They demanded to know why the man was following me. He fed them a fabricated story, claiming to be my older brother. I kept silent, continuing to shake my head. But these two men seemed to grasp the gravity of the situation. They started yelling at the man, accusing him of something I hadn't even disclosed. Sensing an opportunity while the man was distracted, I made a run for it. He noticed my escape and attempted to chase me. However, the two burly men weren't having any of it. 
They tackled him and forcibly bundled him into the back of their pickup truck. He was screaming at this point as they sped off at an inconceivable speed right past me and kept going. I was relieved that they had taken him away, but I didn't stop running until I reached home. To this day, I have no idea what became of that creepy man or what those two strangers did with him. Frankly, I didn't want to know. I recounted the incident to my parents and we decided to alter my route home from school. Thankfully, I never saw him again and for that I am eternally grateful. Even after all these years, that memory of sheer terror followed by relief still lingers in my mind. It serves as a stark reminder of the kindness of strangers and the importance of trust in our most vulnerable moments.